At Kelly Companies, it is no secret that they believe in the power of people. In an effort to help their Keelians get to know each other a little bit better, they decided to launch the Who Do You Know campaign. The goal was simple. Keelians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at keelycompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Today, you're in for a radical journey with me. So grab your backpack, grab several extra things of water, maybe a change of clothes. You might need it for this one. We're about to go, you and I, on a wild, wonderful adventure with a gentleman who describes himself today as a philosopher of life. And he believes that nothing promotes growth more than the unexpected experience and unconventional thinking. But the question you and I should be asking ourselves is where did this appreciation for life and unexpected thinking originate for this gentleman? Well, here's where it came from. In the depths of the uncharted Amazon rainforest, Yossi Ginsberg was tested to the extreme. I'm telling you. After losing his three companions and without food, without fire, without a weapon, and with nothing else to his name, Yossi battled to survive for more than three harrowing weeks. It's an unbelievable survival story. As the inspiration for the movie Jungle, starring Daniel Radcliffe, Yossi believes that we all possess the ability to overcome life's even most unexpected challenges and tremendous seasons of change through our lives. As Yossi shares his spectacular lessons of survival, you're going to find yourself inspired to expand your horizons, adapt to changing circumstances, and rediscover your inner strength. I'm telling you, you're going to be lit up on this one. My friends, while my friend Yossi is joining us from his home in Israel, you're going to leave this conversation feeling profoundly connected to his story, mesmerized by his attitude, and with a refreshed perspective that despite the headwinds we all face, the best of our days individually and collectively remain ahead. So my friends... Get ready for a wild journey into the jungle of life with my friend, and now yours. His name is Yossi Ginsberg. Yossi, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you, John. It's a privilege. I'm so glad to be here with you. My friend, it is indeed my privilege. And when I have a, an explorer and an entrepreneur and a father and an author and a speaker and all the other jobs that you that you've had in your life and have in your life, it's hard for me to even succinctly introduce you. So let me ask you to do it for yourself. If you and I were to meet in a Caesarean, maybe coffee, coffee shop, and I said, hello, my name is John O'Leary. Tell me about you. How, how would you introduce yourself? I don't identify with certain job or profession or study or even, you know, family circumstances, etc. So basically, I would say, if I have to like take your question seriously and not as a polite question, <laughs> I would say I'm a traveling soul. And in terms of my vocation, I never worked in a job, you know, like my work is to express myself in the world. And hopefully expressing myself in the world yields also my livelihood. But I don't take a job for the sake of a job. I take a job for the sake of purpose, for a sake usually of a dream. My education is ongoing. I love learning. Usually I learn languages. So by now I speak about eight languages, but I constantly learn languages. Some people, you know, like they do crosswords. I learn languages. Yeah. I respect culture. And I must say, I disrespect nationalities. 
I respect cultures, but I don't respect nationalities. So, so I would stop here. <laughs> well, I asked you to tell me about yourself while we we're grabbing a tea or coffee and assumed you would say I'm a speaker or I'm a nomad or I'm, I'm this job. And, and instead you shared way outside the box, which knowing your story doesn't surprise me, but it does make me want to take a seat and learn more. So that's what we're going to do together today as we celebrate some of the dreams you've had, some of the accomplishments that you've been part of, and ultimately what it means for our listeners and viewers. So I'm going to go back in time a little bit. You're back in Israel where the story began. Would you just share a little bit of, of what it was like for you growing up there as a child? Yeah, my generation, I was born in 1959. So my parents, like many of my generation's parents, were Second World War refugees, Holocaust survivors. And um, this is the case of my parents. So basically, it comes with certain attitudes of the older generation that we as kids absorb. So the trauma of our parents is part of um, you know, what we have inherited culturally uh, through the environment. And then you have another culture that is very strong, which is an, an emerging state. I was born in 59. Israel was born at 48. So Israel is just 11 years older than me. The country, the state of Israel is, is, is a new state. So I'm a part of a new state. Um, and in an environment, there is constant collision and confrontation and heroism of wars and survival on of the of the nation you know on, on on a national level there is survival there's a conflict the conflict that is very much alive but then you know i feel already at a young age we are being molded we are being molded we are being molded as jews especially with the trauma of the holocaust which is very fresh you know the holocaust ended the second world war 44 45 I was born 59. It's not that many years after. No. So all the, you know, the older generation of our parents, you know, they all have numbers and, and, and you know, tattooed on their hands, uh, on their arms, and they have these terrifying stories. And then we have this, is you know, the other mold. So we have the Jewish mold, and then we have the Israeli mold. Now, the Israeli mold is very strong because it's a nation in survival. So the nation needs its use for its own survival. So we, we are being brought up this way. And I grew up in the suburbs of Tel Aviv um, in a very mundane, normal environment of suburbs. Uh, I go to public school and then to high school. But there is something special about me that I notice. I, most of my education comes from books. The teachers, they bored the death out of me because that's <laughs> mostly the nature of teachers they don't tell you stories they lecture to you lectures make you you know you cannot concentrate but the books are fascinating so i read books throughout school and i read books at night and i read books the the moment that my eyes are open i i read so i have this thirst for knowledge but it comes through story then i discover that i am a storyteller you know, so what, what kind of what kind of books were you reading? You said I'm, I'm an avid reader, but I'm sure there was a genre you loved. I read them all. I, I read all genres. I remember one time I was in geography class and the teacher caught me. You know, I was so absorbed in the book and the teacher, you know, she came like a cat slowly and then she <laughs> just assaulted me and jumped on me and the entire class watching it, everybody's <laughs> silent. And she jumped on me and she just grabs the book from my knees under the table and raises the book, you know, is triumphantly. And then she looks at the cover and the cover says, Life of Michelangelo by Irving Stone. So the teacher said, please keep on reading. You know, she gives me back the book. I was really avid, avid, avid reader. It was a beautiful thing. I was never bored, ever. I, had, I always had a book. These are three books that I can mention that I became addicted to. They always travel with me. Zorba the, the Greek. I read this book about 50 times and I always travel with it. Second is Dune by Frank Herbert. Yeah. I read it like 50 times as well. And I keep on reading them. 
And there's another book that I really love. Not, not many people know this book. It's by John Steinbeck. It's called Danny from Tortilla Flat. But related to my story, you know, like um, I, uh, you know, like the adventure Shackleton, the endurance, and then Fawcett journals about the exploration of South America. Then Henri Charrier and Papillon about the great escape from the Devil's Island. And, and, you know, all this ignited my imagination. And by ignited my imagination, I mean I started hallucinating that I'm there inside the book. So I'm part of the expedition. Several of the books you mentioned, I also read as a child and read recently, including Endurance. I, I read it this past summer and the summer before. I, I think it's a phenomenal book. But I never fathomed or imagined going on a wild journey myself. I'm very content living in the middle part of the United States. You, my friend, not only were deeply moved by these stories, you realized you wanted to become part of these stories. Just talk about that process. I started having a fixation about an adventure of my own, reading all these books. And already during high school, I was trying to, to have my first great adventure, which was very dangerous. I wanted to go to Petra, to the Red Rock. At that time, there was no peace agreements between Jordan and Israel. And this attempt was made by other youths, and many of them were, were killed by Bedouins just attempting to get to the. So I had this fantasy. I, you know, I tried to organize a group, but it never happened. But I had this adventurous spirit. I had this adventurous spirit. It wasn't enough for me to read. I wanted my own adventure. Mm. And then I started dreaming about South America and something about the Amazon was so fascinating but about the Amazon I wanted the tribes I imagined myself you know tribal people I was so drawn to that and I wanted to actually become part of a tribe but since the imagination allows for everything I wanted a tribe that was never explored before like I'll be the ones that discovering them they live in the, the wilderness in the uncharted and I'll somehow make contact with them and they'll adopt me and they'll turn me into one of them. I'll be a warrior. I'll be a hunter. I'll marry the daughter of the chief. I'll find El Dorado, you know? So it was all the mesh from all the adventure books. I decided I'm going to do it. But I actually was serious about it. Yeah. I was serious about it. So when I had the first opportunity, which was the moment I was released from the military service, which was mandatory, still is mandatory, three years. Those were beautiful years because I was served in the Sinai. Mm. And the Sinai is a huge desert, beautiful desert on the Red Sea. We're going to talk a little bit more around your experiences in nature because you leave the, the military service at age 21. You go to Norway eventually venture into Alaska, and then you come down south to South America to begin this, this adventure, man. And I, you, you traveled Peru and all these various other countries. You end up, I believe, in Bolivia. What was it you were seeking in Bolivia? The same. You know, I, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't come to South America to travel. I wasn't like a backpacker, though I was, but I didn't identify with being a backpacker traveling. I didn't know anything about it. For me, I went to explore the Amazon. I was very naive. But naivete is strength. What is the opposite of naive? Educated, experienced, grown up, and scarred, and, uh, you know, beaten. Yes. And, you know, that's the opposite of naive. Cynic, cynical, and skeptical. I was naive. I was bright-eyed naive. And I went and looked, you know, like uh, for my adventure. Can I can I ask you about that word, naive? You've written several times, and I've heard you share from the stage several times, that the most powerful weapon on the earth is someone who is naive. Mm, I, believe I, love, that. I, I think that I, the whole concept is brilliant, but it also at first seems um, soft and probably not accurate. Tell me why that is accurate. Why is one of the most powerful weapons on earth naivete? The naive can soar. The naive is unshackled. The naive doesn't know, so the naive is not educated enough to know what's not possible. Yeah? Hmm. The naive um, was not beaten enough by his experiences to have them 
as burden and limit his next experience to have the fear. If you're not naive, you cannot dream. Your dream is actually limited to constraints. And then you know what's not possible. And knowing what's not possible make it impossible. Impossible is a concept. And people that don't have that com com um, concept know that everything is possible. And I think, you know, I can quote probably Picasso and also Walt Disney talking about that, Einstein talking about that, all saying the same thing. Imagination is far superior to knowledge. So the naive is imagination, not knowledge. I'd like you to share with our listeners a, a little bit more around three of the naive explorers that you bump into and eventually step into the Amazon jungle with. Yeah. Some of them are just models of not, not yeah. only naivete, but vibrancy. Marcus, for yeah. one, yeah. seems like one of the most alive human beings I've ever read about. So just talk, tell, talk, tell us briefly about who Marcus. You know, when I, when I wrote my book, I, I just uh, wrote what happened. So I had no perspective. With retrospective, I can look at the characters, you know, like Marcus, Kevin, and Carl, and see that actually they're archetypal. Each one of them represent an archetype. Totally. Marcus' archetype was the saint, you know. He was truly a saintly being. First of all, he was beautiful to look at. He had this, like, beautiful face. And this long chestnut hair and John Lennon um, glasses. And I never met somebody so graceful, some, some, somebody so generous, so loving, so endowing, in a way that was like really extreme. Marcus was compassionate. Marcus was a giver. He was, he was drawing to everybody loved Marcus. He, he was so patient and so giving and so kind and so generous. There's a lot of pain because, you know, like, in a way, that's the hardest thing for me to experience is to recall what happened in, in, in the story, what happened to Marcus and how I, my conduct, yeah, which I had to deal with. I still have to deal with, but it's different. Because he clearly is this Marcus friend of yours. A, ro a romantic man, a knowledgeable guy, great with languages and music and generous and loving and joyful and awesome. And ultimately, he will end up betrayed. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. We want to make sure our listeners stick around for that one. He's not the only character that you enter into the Amazon with, though. Talk about yeah. Carl, because Carl is a man. Talk about an Carl, amazing uh, individual. Yeah. Is the magus. Carl is the magician. Um, Carl is that mysterious character that meets me in the streets of La Paz. And he has this talent that only later I realized because he, I've been, you know, traveling through all South America in search of my dream. And here's this man giving me my dream in the streets of La Paz. And he tells me he's a geologist, he's explorer of the Amazon, he's searching for treasures but he's searching them by making contact with tribes because the tribes know. And he tells me stories about the tribes and the rituals. And, and he's telling me my own dreams. Little did I know that this is his talent. Carl archetype is the magician. He can sniff your dream off your shoulder. And then he tells you your own dream. And then you succumb. If, you know, you just follow him. So he had this tremendous power. He was also in his element. Once in the jungle, he was the king of the jungle. Later, what I think about Carl, that this was the show of Carl, and a show needs audience. He wasn't mm -hmm. complete unless we were there to experience this bigger-than-life character. So that's but how you understand it now, that, that it was his performance. Yeah, but there was darkness to him. I researched Carl very well all his stories ended up with tragedy. He led us very irresponsibly, so he took care of us. So there was these two sides of him. He was a great guy. He was the most amazing storyteller I ever met. He was the best guy. He was also, he, he constantly was hardworking and he was a yes. master with the machete. Yes. But he had this darkness to him and this darkness, he had to leave a tragedy behind. It was bigger than him. So if we move to Kevin, please. Kevin, 
I call him the knight. Okay, if the true sto- hero. I call of the him story, Captain America as I get to know him. He just seems <laughs> like the typical American quarterback. He was. So he grew up at the Dallas, Oregon. It's about I don't know, like thirty miles north of Portland, small town. Catholic family, seven brothers and sisters, all of them with the father going hunting, going fishing, going rafting. He was an alpinist climbing in, 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 um, in Oregon and in, 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 in Washington. He was like a professional climber. He was a professional whitewater rafter. And he, was an, he grew up in nature. He loved nature. Many adventures. He, 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 he ventured all alone. He was comfortable. And here, Kevin was part of our adventure. So he was a knight. By saying a knight, I'm saying Kevin was noble by character. Yes. So he didn't have a choice but to do the right thing. And I would say about my character, just briefly, that if I have to, to you know, label my archetype, I would say the dreamer fool. These four characters aren't just fictional characters in a childhood book. These are four human beings who leave the safety of civilization, grab a couple of machetes and a shotgun, a little bit of food, and walk into the jungle. It's a remarkable story. And at first, it's a beautiful story, but it begins slipping downward relatively quickly. When did you recognize that... um, this is not the easy journey that you expected, that things are getting sideways relatively quickly. Once we left Asariyama, so this is like, in the beginning, it's all excitement and we're in La Paz yeah. shopping and getting the machete and getting the shotgun and the ammunition and hats and, and you know, like it's all very exciting. Then we fly as far as an airplane can take us. It's a military flight to the frontier. And then we walk for four days, but there is a trail. Then there's the, the last community. And once we pass that community, there is no trail. Yes. That's how you are. You understand what uncharted means. Then it's wilderness. And suddenly it's scary because you have no map. I mean, the map is an aerial. So you cannot follow it and there's no trail. But the map is very important because you know where the, you know, like the main arteries, the rivers, and you see the, the, the cordilleras the mountains you know the range of mountains so somehow you 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 have an idea where you are but it's very tough navigation because you have to keep to the river otherwise you 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 get lost immediately in the woods and and that one thing that surprised me re- in reading your work is that uh there's really no sunshine the, yeah. the, the, can- the canopy is so thick in the amazon that you don't see the sun as you journey through the day and, and, and at night, no moon and no stars. So um, the trees are very tall, but the trees, the treetops, it's not just the foliage of the tree, it's actually the vines. They connect all the trees and they make a roof. So the, it's closed. And sometimes, you know, because there's like tremendous storms and rain, a tree would fall and it could create a little opening. But generally, there's a dense roof, so it's 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 dark, and you cannot actually you you, you get lost you you know in seconds you can just you have no idea direction and things like that. We didn't have phones at that time, you know, 1981, and very irresponsibly we didn't have a compass, and we had actually you said a couple of machetes. I'm embarrassed to say. We had one machete, you know, <laughs> and that's so basic. And that shows you about Carl. With all that he had, he was very irresponsible. And he was a control freak. Yes. Carl was a great guide, but it was all about him being the great guide. Yeah. So he would control us, and which gave rise also to those powers of leadership. You know, Kevin was this big guy that was not walking behind another gringo. Yes, a native guide, indigenous, but this was an Austrian guy. And, and Carl was very dominant, but Kevin yielded because Kevin knew that Carl knows, you know, he didn't believe his stories anymore. Carl didn't stop talking. And we, you know, but, and Kevin had no patience for him, but he respected his knowledge. 
So it dominated us while we were in the jungle. Um, okay, so that's one thing, the fear that rises from the wilderness itself, from the unknown, you know, four guys in raw nature was very raw. Elements like if you want to eat, you get a kill, you know, we do eat meat, but we usually, you're not all of us, you know, we're not used to kill it, especially when the meat is monkeys, which are the closest to cannibalism that you can get. Hmm. It's very close to cannibalism. You know, we are related and, you know, the features, the facial features, the, you know, the limbs, this wasn't easy. And that also started getting to us. Um, the jungle is definitely the fifth character. There's more than four characters. The jungle is the, you know, like it all happened in the jungle. And so I had to deal with it. Uh, my, my first notion is that I want to go back. You know, I wanted to betray all my dreams, all my child years of dreaming. And I said, no, maybe it is better just to dream as escapism, but not to follow your dream. I was ready, but I think I was too embarrassed, not from them, from myself to betray my, you know, I had to over, but I was afraid. I was afraid. And that's the first thing I want to tell you about the betrayal. Marcus expressed his fear. Interesting. So I didn't have to. I used, I used this fear so I could pretend I'm courageous. So in a way, that's where it started and other issues started. I cling to Kevin. Kevin was this big, impressive guy. Carl was this big, impressive guy. Marcus, that was my best friend, was you know, lingering behind, worried, complaining. He had a clash with Kevin. So he became more clinging, Marcus. He had a clash with Kevin because he couldn't eat the monkeys, Marcus. He was too kind and too soft. When we killed the first monkey, Marcus ran grabbing his first aid kit. Marcus wanted to, you know, to treat the monkey. It was too good, you know. Even he, he tried, you know, ridiculous things like we could get, get the fruit of a tree. So we chopped the tree down, you know, we cut it. Marcus is saying, no, you know, don't, you know, it's not fair to kill the, the entire tree for the fruit. So Kevin was upset because Kevin was not, this is survival. You know, if you, if you cannot, if it, you cannot handle it, we shouldn't have brought yourself here. Yes. I think Kevin couldn't appreciate weakness in another man. He couldn't appreciate that weakness. He said, you should have been responsible. Don't put yourself in a situation that you cannot handle. Now, I couldn't handle the situation. But Marcus was getting the fire. Marcus was getting the heat. And in a way, and then I'm saying, you know, like, it's tough for me to say that, but, you know, I, 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 and I, I saw what I'm doing. I, I, I couldn't hide it from myself, you know. In a way, I had a win. I was winning over Marcus. Kevin preferred me. He, Marcus was always the most attractive. Everybody fell in love with Marcus. He wasn't that attractive anymore. Mm. Mm. So, he also began not only uh, emotionally falling behind, but physically. You yeah. wrote a lot about his feet and yeah, about how they began to break down and he could not physically keep up with you guys. And it's going to ultimately lead to this inflection point where you've got to turn back or keep going. Exactly. Talk about that decision for some well, of you it, to turn back yeah. and some of you to keep going. That's right. Carl said, let's keep on going. Said one of you will stay with Marcus. The other will go with me. We make contact with the tribe. Like we were going to explore a tribe and we'll come back with the tribes, man, and we'll build a, you know, like stretcher and we'll carry Marcus. So the crazy idea. Um, and then Kevin said no. As I say, Kevin was, he had to do the right thing. And Kevin said no. And it was tough because this was like Kevin's lifelong dream as well. Kevin was a professional photographer on top of that. So he had many of his work published, but on calendar and books, he wanted to get into the National Geographic. And that was his chance to explore a tribe that never saw a camera. 
So he had, a, he had to give up his dream. I had to give him the dream of my beautiful, exotic daughter of the chief and the gold in the river and all my great adventure. And we had to sacrifice our dreams. And we were very upset. And Marcus had to carry that guilt as well. Uh, he spoiled for all of us. He spoiled the great adventure. At that time, he was belligerent. Marcus was belligerent. He was like, there was no food for him. There was only rice and beans. He didn't eat the meat. He lost weight. His feet he developed that kind of, uh, you know, like some kind of fungus or something that, it, you know, the skin started peeling. It was all dotted with a red rash. And then um, we had to take stuff out of his backpack. So we understood at that time that we have no choice but then kevin came up with a crazy idea of his, his own he said let's not walk back let's build a raft and that was a twist the twist was that carl this was the downfall of carl carl couldn't swim so the moment we built the raft carl lost his power to the level of a shaved samson it was actually this mighty mighty figure that is thriving in this environment and dancing through the jungle and like just not afraid of anything he had so much fear of the river while kevin was very confident kevin was a professional whitewater rafter so on the raft the two of them just couldn't hold it you know carl insisted that he leads the expedition kevin lost respect for him they started fighting they split us because marcus stood by carl i stood by kevin and here we went. Four days went like that. And then the next crisis, the next crisis was even crazier because Carl came, he said, I'm not continuing. There's like, you know, like narrow, dangerous passes. There's waterfall. I'm not risking my life for you. I'm going back. But there was no going back. We, you know, when while we walked, we could turn back. But once we took the raft down river, there is no going back. And there is no map and there's nothing. We're hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles away from civilization in the middle of the Amazon. And now the rain, the, the rainy season started. So it's really crazy. And the crazy, crazy, unbelievable, you know, that that Carl decided to walk back into the forest and try to, you know, following a creek, climb up and make, you know, hit some root of smugglers of coca smugglers that is not on the map that he knows of it and from there get to some village that was not on the map and from there it was crazy idea but carl knew the jungle carl really knew that and the river was extremely dangerous so actually it was a relief let's go back into the woods it's easier than the river but kevin took me aside and said no way he said yossi stay with me it's, I've been to much more dangerous situation on the river. It's not the river, it's call. And you know, it's best that Marcus goes out with him. And that was the mad thing that we did. We split. We you split, split in two. Two venture off into the jungle and two decide to go down on whole, made rafts in the forest, in the jungle, down whitewater rafting. It's a pretty remarkable decision either way you went. What was it like saying goodbye to Carl and Marcus? It was the toughest. It was very, really, really tough. And, you know, we, first of all, we had to tell them. Carl was laughing, saying, you know, like, you will be food for the fish here. We will never see you again. And he was right. We never saw them again. Hmm. And Marcus was torn. Because Marcus said, we are three friends. We should stick together. I don't want to split from you. If you go on the raft, I belong with you. And this was like the, you know, that, that will haunt us for the rest of our lives. We refused to take him. What, tell me about that, because it, it wasn't described clearly to me in the book. Why, why not just let him hop on with you? Yeah, it's tough to, to you know, first of all, we it, it was awkward, you know, like we didn't get along. Yeah, you know, like we, and, and this was about an adventure. 
Kevin said, you know, at least we saved that. At least we don't give up on the river. And by Mark was joining us, it was uh, heavy, you know. So I'm trying to justify it, and uh, rightly so. Our psyche at that moment was that it was safer. I really believed. I wanted to go with Carl, I tell you the truth. If it wasn't that, you know, relationship with Kevin, you know, I was young, he was much older and stronger, and I didn't want to let him down. I tell you, this is, you know, more than my adventurous spirit. I didn't want to disappoint him. But I believe that actually Carl is a better way out. I knew that Carl knows the jungle. So it wasn't like we sent him to his desk. I was sure that Marcus is taking the safer, but emotionally, we had to betray him. We had to tell him, Marcus, you're not coming with us. And it was tough. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. He cried. He was, he cried. We had to wait for a few days because he, his, 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 his feet were raw. So we waited a few days until he could walk again. He dried his feet by the fire. And then and in, in this couple of days, his grace came back to him. And he came and he gave us his love. He said, I forgive you. I love you. I'll wait for you in La Paz. I'll wait for you. Everything is going to be fine. We're going to be friends like before. You know, he hugged us, he kissed us, and he said goodbye. And I'll never forget his image, you know, like looking back, waving, and walking behind Carl. Hmm up that um, little creek. And as I mentioned it already, we never, ever saw them again. Nobody, nobody saw them again. And uh, we had to live with it, you know, because we did survive, obviously. I'm here. But he didn't. Marcus <clears throat> didn't come back. There's, there's so much to discuss and not enough time, nowhere near enough time to go through it all. You say goodbye to your friend, he kisses you, turns around, follows a guide into the Amazon uh, Amazon jungle. And that is the last time you see him this side of eternity. You then hop onto a raft with your buddy and you begin whitewater rafting down this unexplored riverway. Yeah, right. uh, again, we're, we're succinctly going through this, but the, the raft is going to get stuck on a rock your friend is going to be able to barely make it to the shore. You have a plan that he's going to eventually pull you off. It doesn't work out. The raft gets unstuck. You go down this passage that is completely unsafe, fall off the, fall off the raft and find yourself by yourself in the middle of the jungle. Once you survive the unsurvivable, because you, there's really no earthly way you should have survived even the rapids that you went through by yourself. What were your first thoughts when you found yourself on the shore? I, 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 initially, you know, it was an exhilaration because just the miracle of staying alive, you know, like coming out of the crazy water, going through rapids and waterfalls and eating rocks and somehow yeah. surviving. So that was like the first thing. <gasps> I'm alive, you know, it was like, wow. It took a minute to realize what begot me you know like it's a terrible tragedy i'm alone this was the same day we parted from marcus and carl so uh, i say goodbye to two friends and i lose the other and i'm all alone i lost all my friends in one day i lost all my equipment the raft everything and i'm there and it's getting dark so i'm alone dark and i'm not safe i'm on the under the cliff you know there's very yes. tiny strips there all rocky and I have no place to put myself. So I just push myself between the rocks and, you know, I have nothing to cover me. And I'm trembling. There's cold and there's fear and the anger, but mostly there's like the shock. But mm -hmm. within that, there's also clear hope. And more than hope it was like certainty. It's going to be all right because Kevin is coming down. Kevin, I saw him. When, when we had this accident on the rock, I saw that Kevin made it to the bank. I made it to the same bank. We we're both. I knew that we were both on the same bank. So it was the right bank of the river. And I, I had no doubt. 
Kevin was on the bank. He's coming down after me. So my estimate was that I was like taken by the river maybe for 20 minutes. So how long can it take? So I was sure Kevin is coming. Now, Kevin, as I described him, it will be fine. Together with Kevin, we'll, we'll deal with it. But he, he, he never came. Mm. It's hard for our listeners and viewers to fathom how jaggedy and mountainy and bouldery and thick and every other descriptor that this forest is. It's it's, it's where, not like you can look is. over a few peaks and see where one another are. I mean, this is this is uh, this is the mighty wild. Amazon. Yes, it's mighty Amazon, and it's mountainous, and it's raining, and I'm wet, and there's no food, nothing to eat, nothing. And I don't have anything. I have my fingernails. So I try to collapse a tree because I know you can eat the heart, the, pal the, uh, the, the heart of the palm. With a machete, it's very easy because the palm is soft. But without machete, it's like to dig with your fingernails the roots of the tree until it falls. And then with the rock to break it. And I understand that I'm actually spending more energy than yes. I get. So there's no food and the fear, every day the fear grows because not, you know, I walk, I scream, but I hear the wind taking my screams. I can hear the river covering my scream. I know nobody can hear me. And, and I don't understand. I don't understand how come Kevin is not coming. Kevin should come. Then after four days, I believe that Kevin didn't come after me, but jumped after me. And then I think if he jumped after me, for sure, you know, even Kevin could not sustain that, that you know, that river. So now I think that Kevin died and I'm alone. And, and this is where my tragedy begins because before, at least I had hope. But after four days, there is no hope. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Now it's a nightmare. Mm. My dream is gone. I remain with a terrible nightmare, isolation, um, disease, famine, beast. It's going to be a yes. cruel death. I'm going to be alone. And the mock of the elements, ha ha, the great white explorer, the daughter of the chief. I hear the mountains laughing, the trees, the river. Here's the hero, you know, crushed smashed and this you know the fourth night is like the dark night of the soul so but then comes the fifth day <laughs> you, you got a phrase man of action man of action tell me what that meant to you back then what did it mean to be a man of action it's from one of the books i read i believe it was from carlos castaneda the don juan so it was the terms that somehow got into my head and this was like my mantra. This was how I would encourage myself. Man of action, man of action, which means it's a very good mantra. Just do the right thing. And doing the right thing, actually, as I, I would discover very quickly, is natural. And that's where, you know, like the transformation began. You had another expression that pain is about the body. Suffering is about the mind. Yeah, that's the miracle that happened to me because... We're talking about, you know, what happened to Marcus, but my feet deteriorated completely, you know, to the extent that I was afraid to take my socks off. It was two chunks of blood and pus formless. There was no pause, you know, it was one chunk. And it was, that how it looked. It was terrible to look at, but, you, you know, it's because I was wet, my socks wet and filled Absolutely. with mud. And then, you know, like grinding the, the, the skin of the, of the feet and the bacteria and the fungi and all that. So I was rotting and it was very raw and the pain was tremendous and the pain was getting worse. So I knew it's not going to be better tomorrow. It's going to be worse. And every single step was pain, but some were more pain if I would, by mistake, step on a root on something hard instead of soft mud, then it will be like just lightning is exploding through my body with pain. Something happened, but my mind collapsed. So what happened? I remained with the pain 
but there was no story. There was no story about the pain. There wasn't, I can't take it, I'm miserable. Why me? It's not fair, no, it's too much to bear. It was quiet. So I remained with the pain. Mm. But there was no suffering. So this is what I say. The pain is in the body. The suffering is in the head. My head wasn't suffering. And it's a miracle. So in a way, uh, this is something that I took to life. Mm. This is something that is applicable. Tell us how. Because so many folks are not listening to this podcast in the middle of the Amazon jungle. But they are listening in the middle of a, a lost wilderness. Many feel as alone right now in their lives as you did back then. Uh, many, many, many of our listeners are struggling. Even if they yeah. have a spouse next to them or children they're raising yeah. or work to go to, they are struggling and they're by themselves. So help us understand this lesson you learned by yourself in the jungle and how to apply it in our lives today. It's... Very simple to explain, and very simple to understand, but it's not simple to apply. Resisting what happened, what is going on, resisting it creates suffering. So accepting it is not actually embracing it. There's a difference between accepting and embracing. Yeah. Okay. So you're not clinging to it. You're not embracing it, but you accept that this is what's going on. So I say sometimes in an extreme way, if you go through hell, then go through hell. You know, it resisting, you know, if this is what's going on and you resist it, then you you have like the the hell you go through, and then you have the resistance to it, which creates more. So you actually double the amount of pain by yes. resisting the pain. So it's easy to say, it's easy to understand, but it's not very easy. Your name, you, you mentioned earlier, dream. You're a dreamer. And for two and a half weeks, you dreamed of, of seeing your friends again. And you, you dreamed of making it to the village and you dreamed of being rescued. And part of it was the dream was pulling you forward. The dream had you. The dream had you, which allowed you to step and step and step and step. You eventually make your way back to a little river beach you essentially pass out and then you have another dream. You hear these noises. And so um, yeah. to talk about when you realize the dream wasn't just wasp making noises, but actually the sound of uh, an engine. So this is, I would say, this is the 20th day. And okay, so. Can we just stop there for a moment? 20 days lost by yourself in the Amazon. Like it's, to just say 20 days, it, it almost cheapens how unbelievably difficult and shocking it is that you are still here, that your life is still present, that you're about to be rescued. So uh, I'm, I'm yeah. blown away by it, man. Me too. So 20 days. Now, at that stage, I'm, I'm in a very bad shape physically because my entire body is one open wound. No machete, you know, like all the thorns and, you know, the falls and the branches. So all my clothes are torn. All my skin is torn and nothing is healing because I'm wet all the time. So it's all one big open wound. I lost so much weight. So beside the torn skin, there's nothing else, just bones. I have no tissues anymore. I look literally like a Holocaust survivor or like Africa disaster, you know, like pictures that we've seen of just skeleton that's what i'm reduced to because the floods they took everything from the jungle floor there's nothing for me to scavenge or so i'm, I'm just skin and i'm all wounded and i arrive at this little opening but i'm afraid of that opening because i'm afraid of a... i experienced already the power of the river i've, I've experienced one flood that threw me deep into the jungle so now I'm trying to protect myself from the river. So I don't sleep on the bank, but I crawl about a hundred yards up. And then I make myself a little shelter. You know, I, I break palm fronds and cover myself. And then the evening comes and it's dusk. And I'm already about, I think, to faint 
where suddenly I hear this noise, and I'm sure this is like a wasp or a bee, because it's like zzz, zzz. so, you know, I'm trying to get it, and then it grows stronger. And then I open my eyes and I look around, and there's no bee, and there's no wasp, nothing, but I hear the buzz. So I just raise my head a bit and look, and I see something unbelievable. I'm not even sure it's real. I see a dugout canoe like the way you travel on the Amazon in dugout canoes with an outboard motor. And that's the motor. It's not a wasp. It's the motor. And I see that boat approaching that opening where I am. And I cannot believe it. And I see it. they're coming. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to scream. I cannot get up. And then, you know, this will sound like a Hollywood movie because <laughs> it's, it's too much to believe that it's true. The boat lands on that opening. Two people jump off and they turn the boat and push it back into the river. And they jump back on the boat and now the boat is going away. <laughs> and by then I'm pulling myself up. And when I pull myself up, I see the boat going down river and they don't see me, and I'm trying to scream, and no voice comes. I'm trying to scream, and I'm standing there. Basically, I'm just looking at the boat, and once they veer around the, that curve coming, I will lose contact with them. Mm -hmm. By some, again, I don't know how, somebody turns the head back, and then I hear a scream, Yossi, Yossi, don't move! <laughs> and it's Kevin screaming. And then the boat turns, and then they land, and then Kevin runs to me. He runs, he's screaming, don't move, don't move. And then we fall into each other's arms, and we both start crying. And we cry and cry, and then the people come, you know, like there's like three native people there in the dugout canoe, and say, hey, 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 it's not safe here. We need to go, and they take me quickly to the boat, and we go down river and it's like, I don't know how to describe that. It's like just. Uh. I'd, I'd like you to try because I, I think one of the most stunning things is that you survived by yourself for that many days in a place that is completely inhospitable for human life uh, by yourself with really no tools or equipment to do so yeah. that everyone, everyone gave up on you. Everyone except for you gave up on you, and one other. Kevin person, didn't give up on me. The night, the night refused to give up, and so although the military would not participate and the embassy would not participate, he continued right. to seek and search and ultimately find. And the final beach that they're going to use to turn around on is, by chance, the one that you were stationed on. It's, it's Hollywood. It's remarkable, and now you're going back down toward, toward home, changed. Yeah but alive, uh, what, what's that emotion like? First of all, you know, like you feel the elation of a miracle. Like, you know, you don't think, you don't believe, you know, everybody knew in that boat, everybody knew this is intervention. This is impossible. This is like hundreds of miles of river and they go for three days, they push and push and push. Then it becomes dark and too dangerous. And they are not searching. They're searching for a, a place they, they can land. And I collapsed the night before. I collapsed on the same place from all the entire, just impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. So that sensation of a miracle, you know, like, I think I was in awe. And then, you know, I got drunk on life itself, you know, on the basic the basic, you know, that we, you know, as you say, there's so many, many people struggling. Mm -hmm. But if we would appreciate the basics, we wouldn't be struggling so much. Mm -hmm. you know? The basic is, you know, we're free. We're surrounded by people. We have food on the table. We have, we have safe place to sleep. We have a blanket to warm us. You know, people complain in such circumstances. I can only be in gratitude and be blessing. Because people don't really understand that this is the most essential, you know. So, you know, my my perspective has changed forever. Yeah. And my appreciation for life, my appreciation for 
society you know I, while being there for 20 days i crave two things food and people hmm. i could spend another few hours at your feet listening to these stories and learning how they affect us in life i i have seven questions that guide all of our guests forward Okay. But before we get to those seven, my final is this. So you, after being rescued, after making it home, after having your feet healed and putting on a little bit of weight, eventually return home. Your father, when he learned you survived, you mentioned coming down, you were drunk on life. Well, your father got drunk on vodka for three days because he was celebrating the return of his son. You're alive and well. And then you go back to the Amazon a couple of times. One to look for your friend. You needed to find Marcus. You never did. There's a whole story behind that that is remarkable. But you also went back to the, the Amazon to thank the people who gave you back life. That's right. And that you found there that um, that they had a need to, that they were losing their young people due to the, due to the cities. So you went back yeah. and you spent several years there building an echo lodge. That's right. It's an amazing... Like, this thing that almost took your life, almost claimed your life, you return to it to pour your life into it. That's amazing. So the question before the Live Inspired 7 is, those 19, 20 days or so that you spent by yourself, what was the ultimate lesson that you learned while you were by yourself in the Amazon? What, what did that time teach you about life going forward? It gave me self-worth because, you know, I... I was shocked at, you know, my ability to do with it, you know. I, I, as I said, I didn't see myself as, you know, like a very able, strong, as I, as I mentioned before, I was scared. Yes. I was weak. But then there was no place for fear. There was no place for weakness, you know. I needed to be brave because the circumstances demanded me. And, you know, I never been a victim again. Yossi, I thank you for your story and for your wisdom and for your life. And, and we wrap up with seven quick questions with relatively fast answers. You ought to get these right away, starting with number one, because you've been training, you've been training for this your entire life. Here we come. Yossi Ginsburg, what is the most impactful book you have ever read? Uh, well, I would say it's The Eye of the Eye by Richard Hawkins. What's one positive characteristic you possess as a little kid growing up outside of Tel Aviv that you wish you modeled as brilliantly today? The ability to absorb myself uh, completely in fearless, string no attached, mm. uh, you know, my, my, that, that freedom of dreaming where everything is possible. As naive as I am, I'm 63 years old, I have four kids and I'm in a relationship. I have obligations that I have to respect, etc. Yes. And, uh, you know, that freedom, that freedom that the kid had is absolutely something that I wish I could maintain. I think it is possible. You're, you're fairly close to living it. I'm wildly <laughs> impressed by it. If your home or your tent caught fire, and all living things are out, but you had an opportunity to run in and grab one item that mattered to you. What's the one thing you would come running back outside with? Look, I lost it already. That item, I had one item that I didn't want to part from. That item was with me in the jungle, actually. It was a little talisman that my uncle gave me, and I lost it already. I'm... I don't think I'm attached to anything apart from the relationships that I have. If you could sit on a bench or a rock, you see, and have a long conversation with anyone, living or deceased, who would you like to be seated next to? I, I don't value anyone more than the next person. You know, mm -hmm. I speak in conferences. I meet the janitor that is cleaning the restroom. I'm engaged in conversation with him. When I meet the CEO... It's just the same yes. for me, yeah? So as the song say, love the one you with, you know? That's awesome. I, you know, I really love the one I'm with. And so I can throw names, you know, like 
Jesus, I guess, is popular. Buddha, but I don't need to meet Buddha or Jesus. They recorded all the wisdom I can read about. You know, so I don't think I need to meet anybody big or famous. Definitely, you know, like fun and, and you know, like harmonious. And I would say, I'll take you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Let me give you a hug. You and I are going to sit and have some tea. I, just I look forward like to that because this was all about me, me, me. And I would love, you know, a little bit of you in that conversation. Uh, I'll tell you I, what, next I, time. I know, I know that your story is a hundredfold bigger than mine and your lessons as well. well Talking about endurance and character and courage so what i will say is when i speak and uh meet the executives i'm i'm in awe of them but no more in awe than when i meet a, a janitor or a custodian so i think you and i agree that uh people are remarkable and they should be honored for who they are and the dignity of their life so i think that's something you and i can talk about on that park bench one day and i look forward Absolutely. to that visit just yeah. two questions left sure what's the best advice you've ever received be here now you know i think that's the best advice and i would say i encountered it on the back of a, a ram das book be here now because there is no other place and it's so silly not to be in the only place that exists so if you could go back in time and whisper some advice to yourself before you set foot in the Amazon, before South America, before Alaska and Norway, before you even left the army of Israel. So go back in time to age 20. What, what advice would you give yourself? Make sure you have your own machete. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at that time, having my own machete would have been a totally different story can make fire because i had the lighter but i couldn't make fire with a machete you can make kindling with a machete you can make shelter you can collapse a tree you can dug you know yes yes Ginsburg, you survived by yourself without a machete for 20 days it has been said my friend that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence how would you like your one sentence to read you know daniel Radcliffe. He, he, he played my character in the movie so we got to spend I was honored to be invited to be on the set and we get to spend some time together and I told him uh, no matter what this story is bigger than me and people don't stop associating myself me with my story you know like this is we're talking 41 year after this story you know and he said Yossi he said, Yossi, I'm telling you, I know that's Daniel Radcliffe telling me. They're going to, on my tombstone, they're going to write Harry Potter. <laughs> so I know that, and I accept it, that the sentence that would defy me survived against all God in the Amazon. You know, mm. it's not my choice. You know, that this is the burden, and it's not such a big burden. It's a privilege. Um, but definitely, um you know i would i would love to believe that you know one i would want to have something like it was loving and you know it was fun um in the end it's about you know our biggest our biggest happiness is to know that we were of meaning so that's what i would like to be you know for the immediate relationship and you know I'm, I'm privileged like you that we touch many 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 more people than just our immediate friends and family it's a huge privilege and i'm really really appreciate it. Mm. appreciating that yes Ginsburg survived against overwhelming odds by himself in the amazon came home was fun was loving was generous yeah. and viewed his life as a privilege and Yossi, it has been our privilege having you part of our Live Inspired family during this podcast. I really, really appreciate our friendship, which, you know, is a great friendship, even though we just started it. 
Yes. So to be continued, you're my NBA. My friends, I told you that it was going to be a radical, wild journey into not only the Amazon jungle, but into the struggles and opportunities in all of our lives. Yossi's story, his wisdom, his perspective on life elicited so many emotions within me. I want to highlight one part of today's conversation that I found especially profound. I'm not sure about you, but if narrowly surviving three weeks in the depth of the Amazon rainforest all by myself... Without fire, without food, without a weapon, I'd be booking a one-way flight back home. I'd kiss the ground when I got there. I'd never leave again. Instead, Yossi, just a few years later, returns to the Amazon River Valley, made it his home with the creation and the construction of a solar-powered ecolodge as his goal. One that he built, one that remains, one that changed positively that entire community. Then, by teaching the locals how to manage that eco-lodge, he made a life-changing impact on the indigenous people and that region. It continues to inspire that region, that part of the world, and the entire world, even to this day. If you enjoyed Yossi's story of survival, you'll love my conversation with one of my heroes, one of my buddies. His name is Nando Parado. In 1972, there was a historic plane crash. The only one in which the plane was flying at both cruising speed and altitude crashed and had survivors. One of those survivors is Nando Parado. In street clothes without food, Nando survived the winter of the Andes. You can listen to that conversation with Nando Parado on Live Inspired episode number 84. If you can't find it there, cruise on over to my website, johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. So, my friends, I want to thank you for tuning in to our episode this time. I want to thank you for being part of our Live Inspire community. And I want to remind you that regardless of the headwinds and challenges you face in the jungle of life, that the foundation is firm, you are not alone, and the best is yet to come. So, for this time and until next time, my name is John O'Leary. Today is your day, fellow adventurers. Live Inspired. You know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. Guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started. You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at keeleycompanies.com.